Okay, if everyone could please take their seats, we're going to start the next panel. Um, my name is Ted Lamb. I'm a research fellow at the Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment at UC Berkeley School of Law with uh, Ethan Alkine and Jordan Diamond, who you met earlier. Um, and this is panel two, financing and implementation challenges for zero emission technology at the ports. Um, we have with us today four experts, two from the world of trucking and transportation and two from the world of banking and finance. Um, Michelle Iturralde, on my left, uh, is a senior vice president for the Middle Market Global Commercial Bank at Bank of America Merrill Lynch, based here in LA. Um, she leads their aerospace, defense, and government services practice in LA and has a focus on the industrial and manufacturing sector. Uh, Vic LaRosa, uh, to her right, is the founder, president, and CEO of Total Transportation Services, Inc., a comprehensive transportation and logistics services provider and one of the largest delivery carriers in Los Angeles and the Port of Long Beach. He has a professional background spanning the industries of transportation, warehousing, trucking, logistics, distribution, and clean tech. Brian Rockwell, all the way on my left, is a managing director and co-head of Western Region Public Finance for Bank of America Merrill Lynch, also based here in Los Angeles. And in this capacity, he's responsible for coverage of infrastructure issuance by municipal entities across the Western United States. And then to my immediate left is Chris Shimoda. He's the Vice President of Government Affairs for the California Trucking Association, the largest trucking trade association in the state of California. Chris works with California agencies, including the Air Resources Board and the Highway Patrol, on the development and implementation of major programs and regulations impacting the trusting uh, industry. Uh, each of our panelists is going to give a brief presentation with slides, um, and then we'll move into discussion and uh, questions with, uh, followed by audience Q&A. So I believe Chris's slides should be first. Can we just check to make sure that that's what comes up? All right, can you run the next one? Excellent. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I hope you're all getting your afternoon coffee and, and hopefully my presentation helps rather than uh, hurts any fatigue you have. Um, so thank you, first of all, to UCLA and UC Berkeley uh, for putting this event on uh, for starters and then also for the invitation to participate. Um, I'd like to frame the discussion. You know, we've heard, um, I think, a lot of information that um, informs the discussion, but specifically to the ports of LA and Long Beach, um, give a little bit of a perspective of, you know, who operates at these ports, uh, what type of trucks are operating there, and then some of the prospects um, also for transitioning this fleet to zero emissions, uh, since that's the, uh, our topic today. Um, so this data comes from the uh, Port of LA and Long Beach's um, uh, inventory that they publish. It's from November of 2017. So this doesn't apply to all ports in the state of California, but you'll, you'll find very similar uh, data at the other ports uh, within the state. Um, so when you look at the type of trucking company operating um, at the port complex today, um, it's not a homogenous, you know, one-size-fits-all fleet. Uh, what you have is about 3% of the licensed motor carriers, or LMCs as we call it um, in the business, um, which are larger fleets of 100 or more trucks. Um, they do about the quarter of the cargo, and they, they control about a qu quarter of all the trucks um, in the port complex. Um, but as you can see, um, once you start getting down below 100 trucks, um, this is really what makes up the vast majority of the port trucking fleet. It's, it's companies that run um, approximately 40 to 50 uh, trucks um, or less. Um, they move about uh, three-quarters of the cargo and control about three-quarters of the trucks. So um, again, this is data from November of 2017. Um, currently, 97% of the trucks operating at the ports of LA and Long Beach are uh, run with diesel. Um, you got about 600 natural gas trucks making up the other 3%. Um, so the fleet is both run on diesel currently. And then we have about 50% of the trucks in the ports um, uh, meet what's known as, for those of you who don't follow on-road heavy-duty emission standards, what's known as the EPA 2007 emission standard, uh, which has technology like diesel particulate filters, which is about 99.9% .9 effective in reducing diesel particulate matter, um, as well as exhaust gas recirculation to lower NOx levels. Um, but what you see in that big um, sort of drop-off in that 2009 category is when we went to something known as the EPA 2010 model year standard, which then incorporated something called selective catalytic reduction uh, to get another 85% reduction in NOx um, from that 2007 standard. 
Um, because of uh, new proposed restrictions uh, for who can actually now enter for the first time into the port uh, drayage truck registry, um, you're going to see a freeze on any older trucks entering the port complex. You're going to have to be a 2013 or newer model your truck to, to come into the, uh, the fleet for the first time. Um, and state regulations are going to require this whole fleet of EPA 2007 model your truck. So those, those three biggest bars that you see there for 2007 through 2009 uh, to be retired by uh, 20, the year 2023 via the, the statewide truck and bus rule. So essentially half of the trucks that are currently operating in the port are going to need to go away by 2023. So uh, what are the challenges to deploying zero emissions in this fleet? And I think, you know, a lot of the speakers today have already um, spoken to many of these um, concerns. But, um, you know, a lot of this is similar to other sectors that we're looking to deploy um, zero emission trucks. The CTA doesn't just uh, represent um, poor truckers, but we have folks in every possible vocation that you use a truck. Um, and a lot of this is the same discussion, um, no matter where we're having it. Um, so one of the biggest um, hurdles right now is obviously commercial availability um, of zero emission um, commercial trucks. So while drayage truck zero emission pilots have been going on for over a decade, and I know uh, Vic is going to be covering um, his company's experience um, at the forefront um, of testing a lot of these technologies, we still do not have a fully commercial, uh, fully supported and warranty truck um, in this space. Um, spoke a little bit about charging infrastructure and availability already, um, and so I won't belabor that point. Um, the upfront and ongoing costs of zero emission trucks are an issue, and we'll talk about that in a second on the next slide. And then finally, um, limited range and increased weights um, are an issue. It's not really a matter of the can, you know, you accelerate as quick as a diesel, but um, as you know, you know, there's sort of this range versus weight trade-off. You could conceivably, you know, have a 500 to 750 mile electric truck. It's just you're, you're going to have so many batteries you can't haul cargo. So there's likely a sweet spot on that range versus weight trade off. As batteries get better, you're going to see um, uh, lower weight batteries doing more range. It's just a matter of that is still currently a very uh, major hurdle um, in this particular space where uh, the less cargo you haul, the less revenue you're going to be able to, uh, to achieve. So um, that's sort of the state of the existing technology. We obviously have these hurdles that are known, um, but there are advances being made um, and that need to be made uh, to make these commercial zero emission vehicles viable. And I, I just want to point to a study that a group called the North American Council for Freight Efficiency, Efficiency or NACFI for short, uh, just put out um, that lays out some of these challenges. If um, you take a look through this this checklist, it goes through a lot of the sort of key performance indicators that a fleet looks at uh, when assessing, um, you know, what truck to buy and sort of their operating costs. And what was very interesting about this study is that they really lined up all these things and said, okay, well, at what point is the battery electric vehicle technology specifically um, going to either gain parity with or exceed the baseline diesel performance? And so it, the very interesting conclusions from the study is that um, given advances, some of the things that were talked about by earlier speakers, there is going to be a time in the future uh, where you are no longer looking at this as sort of a, you know, esoteric policy decision, but a, a real specific business decision that says in certain vocations and duty cycles, um, you could conceivably save money by running the battery electric technology. And so that's something very important um, to remember. Um, so today, um, you know, you simply do not have a commercially available competitive um, zero emission truck um, available, but this is not to say that they won't ever be. Um, and this is, you know, going to be a real key to widespread deployment. And I don't get to say this very often, but I 100% agreed with the statement from Joe Liu um, earlier on his panel where he said, you know, this is really about getting to that point where um, this is the business decision to make. Um, if you're an operator, um, trucking, if you don't know, is probably one of the most competitive industries um, that there is. There's just a huge amount of players in the space um, operating on razor thin margins. Anything that gives a truck operator an advantage on operational costs, maintenance, um, total cost of ownership, um, this is something that's not going to need to, 
you know, uh, need to have a lot of explaining to the fleet operator who's, who's managing that bottom line. And so uh, the conclusion of the NACV study is, I, I, I think, a very good, sorry for throwing a bunch of words at you on this, on this slide, but um, this was sort of the, the high-level takeaway from, from NACV is that um, there is, you know, I think little doubt that everyone is saying zero emission trucks are going to have a role um, some, t uh, some point out in the future. Um, and that, as uh, the prior panel talked about, there are these efficiency improvements happening in, in the ZE technology that uh, potentially are not going to be able to be matched by further incremental improvements in internal combustion engine technology. So um, ultimately, cost is going to become the driver of adoption as much as it is a hurdle today. So it's something to think about. Um, and it, that over the next several decades, um, the overall fleet is going to diversify. Um, you're really going to optimize the specific technology, the duty cycle, um, the charging scenario, um, you know, the business case that you can make within your fleet. Um, and you will see some um, areas, you know, in the near future where Z does become the uh, preferable option. But you will most likely see over the next several decades um, all of these different technologies sort of still existing uh, with each other and competing for different spaces. Um, and also, of note, the internal combustion engines are going to be um, developing as well, getting cleaner and more efficient. So it's, it's a win-win for everybody. Um, so with that, thank you, and uh, look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, and uh, Vic, I believe your slides are next. Would you like to come up? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Vic LaRosa, and I'm the President and CEO of Total Transportation Services, Inc. Uh, we are a, a trucking company that provides services for delivering containers from the ports to distribution centers, and then we also have a regional trucking operation that runs um, uh, generally within a five to 600 mile radius of Southern California. Uh, we, our fleet is somewhere, we're one of the larger uh, uh, trucking companies in the port. Our fleet is somewhere around, total fleet is somewhere around 400 trucks. Uh, we also have operations on the East Coast as well. Uh, to tell you a little bit about our journey, we've been uh, experimenting with um, the, the clean air, zero emission trucks since 2007. Uh, we made, once we, once the port came out with its decision to release the first Clean Air Action Program, we started to do, as a corporation, a lot of research into the issue of, uh, of pollution uh, from these trucks. And at that time, back in 2007, we made a commitment to go to zero emissions. The only issue was we had no technology to get us there. So as we started to uh, um, th these were the trucks prior to um, the Clean Air Action Program, and these are the old, polluting, 20-year-old vehicles that you heard so much about in the ports that needed to go. And fortunately, they have gone since 2007. The issue that we're seeing now is we're seeing a little bit of a relapse as these uh, uh, the, the trucks that do qualify as clean uh, come are, are 10 years old and coming back into the ports. That has um, made the ports move to a Clean Air Action Program 2, which should be uh, picking up the, uh, the pace in, uh, in getting the uh, cleaner trucks into the market. Um, we were the first ones to take delivery of the first 15-liter natu natural gas trucks. Then we also made a significant investment in the 8.9-liter natural gas trucks. Both of those trucks were a big, big disappointment. Um, we are now moving into an area where we are testing a tremendous amount of vehicles. And the way that we are looking at this is that we, we are looking to put the application with the technology. So when Chris mentioned that it could be less expensive to run a battery truck in a certain application, th that is absolutely true. So the way we see this shaking out is there's three different types of technologies that we're ex experimenting with, natural gas, uh, battery, and hydrogen. 
Uh, these are the battery trucks, the manufacturers that we're currently working with, TransPower, BYD, US Hybrid. We have all of these trucks, multi in some case multiple uh, trucks in our fleet. We have the charging facilities in place. We have a, a facility on Terminal Island where we are charging these vehicles. And in the short run, these vehicles do a very, very effective job. But there is a weight issue. These are the trucks that we, we've been running, the 12 liter. Uh, we've got the alpha and beta engines of the 12 liter uh, uh, Cummins Westport engine, the new natural gas engine. We've been running that in six trucks for the last 12 months. That truck is very, very promising. It's coming in at 0 .01 NOx, uh, but it still uses, we're using renewable natural gas in the truck. These other trucks, we're taking delivery of the Kenworth truck on Monday, which is a hybrid natural gas. Uh, and then we also have this U.S. hybrid truck, which we've converted from the old 8.9 liter engines by throwing an electric motor behind it. It's a very, very effective uh, uh, truck, very expensive transition. These are the new trucks. Again, on uh, we've actually, t the TransPower truck we have in the fleet, the U.S. hybrid we truck we have in the fleet, and the Kenworth hybrid hydrogen truck arrives in our fleet on um, Monday. The promising, the most promising thing about Kenworth stepping into the arena uh, from a trucker's perspective is that we now have a company that understands trucks. It's not necessarily an integrator, not that there's anything wrong with the integrators. They've developed some very, very nice and advanced technology, but we need those warranties and we need the experience of a, of a, a, a large truck manufacturer. Um, our biggest issue is going to be infrastructure, fueling infrastructure. Virtually nothing, uh, hydrogen virtually doesn't exist. Um, CNG and LNG are now starting to grow uh, in the market. And uh, we see solar, uh, we have plans. We ha we're taking a much more, more global view of how we want to uh, fuel our fleet. Um, these are some of the electric chargers that we use. Um, we have a clean energy station right down the street from our facility where we're getting our LNG and our CNG. And um, we're develop we have a 100 acre parcel in the port, uh, right, the big, the blue X. Uh, it was previously known as uh, LAXT Customs House. The, the land has been vacant for a while. Uh, we've, uh, we, we got involved with the port. We, uh, through an RFP process, we were awarded to negotiate for the lease, and we would like to eventually solar panel that entire 80 acres to, to give us the ability to start to create our own fuel, both uh, uh, hydrogen and electricity. Um, that's what the, um, uh, the, the land looks like now as we are going through the negotiations of the development project. That's what it will eventually look like. It will house 3,500 containers. But we would love to see this facility, which is within Terminal Island, serviced completely by battery electric trucks. That would, because the port is a very, very congested, polluted area. The battery truck would be a great uh, a solution to that. Then we can take the hydrogen trucks and the, and the natural gas trucks and go out on the, the road uh, this, on our 60-mile journey. Um, that kind of gives you a, a very brief synopsis of, of where we're going. As I said, we're taking a much more global look at how we're going to build our fleet out and how we're going to fuel our fleet. On that note, I would thank you and bring up the next speaker. Great. Thank you, Vic. Um, and Michelle, would you like to come up? All right. Um, see, one more <laughs> compliance check. <laughs> um, my name is Michelle E. Terralde. I'm with Bank of America Merrill Lynch here in Los Angeles. I manage our aerospace and defense division as well as industrials. Um, we have a significant um, initiative in what we call ESG, environmental, social, and governance, at Bank of America where we made a, an effort and a concerted effort with uh, Washington to make a commitment in investing and lending to the environmental industry to reduce our carbon footprint um, of $125 billion before 2025. 
Uh, we're very proud of that. Every single one of Bank of America's lines of businesses are uh, focused on that and are coordinated to make sure that, that we reach our goal. Uh, we're more than halfway there year to date. We've invested almost 90 billion um, in low carbon footprint and environmental efficiencies. Um, so, you know, happy to sponsor events like this, um, be coordinated with institutions like UC Berkeley and, and UCLA. Um, so again, thank you for coming today. Uh, this chart, this is a pie chart that kind of um, differentiates our investment in, in environmental. Um, kind of the top four, which includes sustainable transportation, um, are wind, energy, um, and solar. And within our transportation um, investment of $8 billion, it includes not just ground transportation, but also people transportation. And we define ground transportation, of course, to be trans uh, trucking, um, shipping, um, transportation, warehousing, and, and real estate. And then the, the bar chart below kind of shows our progression over the last 10 years of our investment and, and where we're at today of over $90 billion. Oops, go back. There we go. Um, this, this is a, a snapshot of all of Bank of America's lines of businesses and how we are invested um, and how we're focused in, in the environmental um, uh, investments. Um, I am part of the Global Commercial Bank, which is the fourth from the bottom, as well as our leasing business. And together, we have about a $14 billion investment in environmental efficiencies year to date. Um, the Global Commercial Bank is the, is the group I work with. I'm focused on financing private companies and publicly traded companies um, in the middle market. And what we, how we define the middle market are really company size. Um, and those, the sizes of companies generally range between 50 million in annual revenues up to 2 billion, which is, is essentially the lifeblood of, of Southern California. The next slide here is, is a snapshot of um, a survey and kind of our uh, focus on our investments over the next five to 10 years and how we're going to get to that $125 billion goal. Uh, the first bullet here is a survey um, that we held and we're hearing from uh, cities that their focus really is in alternative fuel vehicles as well as electrical vehicle infrastructure. And of course, with the VW settlement fund of a billion three, that's really helped spur um, some of that activity. Um, also, the dynamics of, of automotive and car companies, their investments have shifted um, here recently over the years given the, the rise in uh, ride sharing programs and, and autom autonomous vehicles. Um, so that, that industry dynamic is, is key to really understanding how we can continue to, to help and assist investment in, in that space. And then of course we've had a lot of, we've heard a lot today about electrical, electric buses and school buses um, and happy to see that those battery costs have decreased significantly and also those, the battery storage um, opportunity um, is something that, that is becoming more commercial. And then last here on the slide is uh, we're seeing a lot of utilities partner up with private companies um, to focus on how they can kind of improve the electrical grid and make it um, more um, meaningful. A lot of there was, although there was a lot of um, back and forth on what what challenges and opportunities we face with our electrical grid today, um, but we do see that as a focus over the next five, ten years for our investment. And then I've got a couple slides here on the trucking industry, but really the experts here have already um, reviewed some of these data. I was happy to see that one of my data points was aligned with Chris's data point. <laughs> um, so our trucking industry is made up of 97% of, of small businesses, which are operating less than 20 trucks. Um, the trucking generates almost $700 billion a year annually in the U.S., um, of that $700 billion revenue trucking generates, about 6% of that, which is $41 billion, is spent on federal and state taxes. Um, there's seven, tr the trucking industry employs 7.5 million Americans, of which 3.5 million of those are actual truck drivers. Um, and uh, today, about $4 million 
4 million Class A trucks, which have really increased over the last 12 months significantly. Um, here I'll highlight some trends we're seeing in the trucking industry and some, some opportunities and challenges. Um, mergers and acquisitions and consolidation within the industry is, is an opportunity. Um, given the, um, how small the business segment is within transportation and trucking, we see a lot of opportunity where larger mid-sized companies have uh, the chance to maybe consolidate some of these smallers and offer some um, professional management. Um, of course, alternative fuels, which we've talked a lot today, not just electric, but hydrogen um, and natural gas. Uh, automation, self-driving, self-driven cars we're seeing, and, and trucks, of course, is an opportunity and a trend. Um, some of the drivers um, on, on the industry going forward is, of course, tonnage. Um, you're seeing those mega vessels, um, you know, being manufactured and creating, and those are bringing now two, three times the amount of containers historically have come into our ports and really the trucking industry will have to catch up and come up with some efficient ways um, of meeting the demand. And some challenges, of course, is um, qualified drivers um, and retention. Um, attracting drivers to the industry is something that, that you know, the, the industry is trying to do better at um, and, and that could be an opportunity. And um, operational costs is, is a big issue. Uh, fuel prices are going up. Um, it's, it's expensive to employ drivers. Um, so, you know, something that, that these businesses have to deal with on a daily basis and stay ahead of the game um, with strong management teams. Um, here we, we've got some trends and challenges within the trucking industry. We've already reviewed some of these. Um, Let's see, I can't see them very clearly, but <laughs> I have a copy here. But I can... So we've talked about the opportunity of um, volume, right? And this is a trend that, that the industry will, will have to figure out a way to, um, you know, uh, purchase uh, the, 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 the timeline and the orders of uh, not just tractors, but trailers as well um, are at a height, uh, higher in 2018 as, than they were in 2017. And sometimes it could take four, six, four, five, six months for um, those deliveries of those vehicles to come through. Uh, we talked about the shortage of drivers and driver turnover um, to be challenges and some um, some challenges in addition to some of the trends we're talking about is the capacity um, issue. Um, and what I found interesting on this slide um, under number seven here is um, capacity tends to be a big challenge, but not so much price. Um, so goods need to be, um, consumers need their goods and they're willing to pay the price for that. So if there's a way that our transportation industry can be nimble, um, and figure out how to meet that demand with their capacity um, and hopefully increase prices um, to make a profit and sustain their businesses, that, that's an opportunity. Okay. And here we go, this is the last slide here. Um, and this is kind of a, a, a forecast and expectations that, that we see here in the next few years. And um, you know, on this first bucket here, um, we see the transportation trucking industry will continue to grow by an average of 3%, if not more, for the next five years through 2023. Um, they, they say there may be a slowdown after the year of 2023, um, but trucks will continue to be the dominant carrier really for freight. Um, although rail yard and shipping is a big part of our logistics systems, trucks are really the only avenue for those goods to get to that specific location, whether it's at that warehouse distribution center or the individual. Fuel costs um, have, have kicked off this year higher, higher than they have in, in several years. I think we're, we've, we've met now 2014 levels. Um, so that's an issue that the industry um, is working through right now and, and figuring out how to mitigate. 
Um, labor wages and maintenance expense um, continues to increase. Um, and, and revenues. Revenues will continue to rise in the industry, but they will be affected given um, the restrictions that you know, drivers now have on the hours they can spend on the road, fuel costs as we discussed, and um, the rise and, in their salaries and the costs associated with that and the, the challenge that the industry has on attracting new drivers. So that's, that's about it. Thank you, Michelle. You're and now, uh, Brian, please uh, present some slides. As Ted mentioned, I'm Brian Rockwell. Uh, I'm based here in Los Angeles with Bank of America Merrill Lynch. My mandate is really for large infrastructure projects, um, generally with the municipal focus. Um, large component financings that have a lot of different sources of revenue streams, a lot of different uh, types of funding mechanisms. So a little bit different than what, uh, than what Michelle is, uh, is doing on a day-to-day -day -day basis. What I want to talk about here today is uh, what some of the tools are that are available for uh, funding those large infrastructure projects um, with obviously a focus on the environmentally sound projects. Uh, one important thing and kind of a theme you'll see throughout this is although I'm a banker and I deal with you know bonds and, and things all day long, um, banks and bonds are just a tool. They're not a free source of money. Um, so we are one of the tools that are available, but in my experience, you need to have a lot of different tools available to you in order to get some of these larger financings done uh, to be able to support the, the ports, the power stations, all the infrastructure that the previous panelists have talked about that are ultimately going to be necessary in order to move forward with some of these, uh, some of these initiatives. More disclaimers. So what are some of these tools? Um, obviously, the best source of money is free money. So, you know, any grants that you, you know, are out there, and there's a lot of programs that are available, um, both at the state level and the federal level. Um, but obviously, there's not enough governmental money to go around. Um, and I would argue that's actually, you know, probably a good thing. Um, at the end of the day, there are projects that do make economic sense and can fund themselves. And those are projects that don't necessarily need to have grant money and shouldn't have grant money. So what we're really going to focus on now is, is talking about the market-based funding. And that's what I do, obviously, on a day-in and day-out basis. Outlined a lot of different programs here. Um, the federal government has a number of different programs that are available. Um, um, unfortunately, that is uh, the, the, one, of the, one of the issues are there's almost too many, too many programs. Um, they're very hard to navigate. Um, they take a long time to get done. The source of funding itself is fantastic. The cost of funds is generally tied to the, the government's borrowing costs, so it's a very, very low cost of funding. Um, but unfortunately, it's a very difficult place to navigate. Um, I'll get into green bonds here in, in a little bit, um, but um, obviously the capital markets and the bank markets have been very, very a good source of funding for a lot of these environmentally sound projects. Um, Michelle touched on that just a little bit. Um, um, I think that, that what you'll find is that um, whether there, it's federal, state, or private, um, you know, there is a requirement for a return on investment. Um, so when you're talking about these types of mechanisms, there really has to be something that is going to ultimately repay those, uh, those, those market-based funding mechanisms that are out there. And we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, and then lastly, just tax incentives um, that are available. Tax credit bonds are, are probably the primary source of this. That is where the federal or state government is providing a tax credit to the investor. Um, it eliminates the, uh, the, the credit risk that that investor faces in, in financing some of these projects. Um, they do still need to get repaid their, their original principal. So, you know, there is some credit risk, but it's more like an interest-free loan um, than it is actually true free money. So just a couple of examples of, of how, we've, uh, how we've financed projects um, here locally. Um, city of Los Angeles street lighting program. Bank of America made a, uh, made a loan to the city to replace all their street lights. Um, what's important about this financing is that the, uh, the city was able to repay the loan with the, the, uh, effectively the savings they received from having more efficient street lighting. So this is a situation where there was a big upfront cost 
but through the loan transaction, they were able to repay that loan um, simply through operational efficiencies. And what you're seeing out there is a lot of different programs like this. Um, municipalities are, are uh, doing this for their HVAC systems, kind of uh, solar systems, other types of energy efficient buildings. This is going to become a much more common phenomenon going forward, is just simply, simply taking advantage of the economic efficiencies that some of these, these uh, environmentally sound projects have. Um, another project here in Los Angeles is Alameda Corridor. Um, this is effectively a competitor to the trucking industry, so I'm cognizant of uh, Vic and Chris, and uh, I'm treading on a little bit of thin, thin ice here. But um, uh, prior to the Alameda Corridor being created, you had uh, 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 railroads that were funneling tr uh, 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 traffic uh, uh, containers through downtown Los Angeles. Um, so it created huge amounts of traffic jams, huge amounts of emissions um, that were created um, from cars just backed up waiting for these trains to go by. The corridor effectively sunk that down below. So these are now rail corridors that are underneath um, sub-level. Um, so you've got bridges where the cars can go over them. And it effectively has eliminated millions of pounds of emissions because of the fact that you've eliminated all of these, um, these traffic jams. Um, the project was funded through uh, about a $1.2 billion bond offering, about $400 million for a federal loan, um, as, as well as a number of other different uh, state and local contributions. That's, uh, that's grant funding. It's also right-of-way donations. Importantly, this is user fee based. So the, both the bonds and the loan are being repaid by surcharges that are placed on the railroads for actually each container that they, they, they put through the corridor. So there is a repayment mechanism that is here. Um, it's a $1.4 billion project. So uh, a lot of constituents needed to be involved in order to get this through um, and get this done. Um, and whether you're talking about loans, whether you're talking about loan guarantees, user fees, um, again, all of those tools that, that, that I referenced on the earlier page is really brought to bear on this, uh, this transaction. Um, the bond markets provided the bulk of the funding, about half of the funding. Uh, but the investors in that wanted to know that others had skin in the game. So the ports are actually guaranteeing about 40% of the bonds, including the federal loan. Um, LAMTA provided uh, grants for the transaction. Uh, the railroads contributed right of way. So you had a lot of different parties that were contributing to make sure that this project moved forward in order to remove all those emissions that we're talking about. Um, I mentioned green bonds early on. Um, they continue to be a big source of, uh, of, of growth in the, uh, in the bond market. We expect to have about $350 billion globally um, in, in green bonds uh, in 2018. And really the issuers here run the gamut, everything from you know, companies like Apple, um, financial institutions like Bank of America, um, some of the, the super sovereigns like World Bank, um, and then uh, a, a lot of municipal issuers as well that are in participating in the green bond market. So what is a green bond? Um, effectively, it, it's the same as a, as a normal bond, um, only the proceeds are being used for some environmentally sound purpose. Um, so there's no difference in the repayment mechanism. There's no difference in the security provisions, the term or tenor or anything. It's really a plain vanilla bond whose proceeds are actually being used for a green purpose. So I guess the question begs itself, you know, if it's the same, why, why would anybody use it? And really the, the driving factor here is from the investor side. Um, what you're starting to see is that we've got investors who will only participate in transactions that have a, an environmentally beneficial um, purpose. Um, and that's true on both the institutional side, it's also true on the retail side, sort of the mom and pop investors now, especially with the younger generation, they want to know that what they're putting their money towards is something that's beneficial for the environment or beneficial for social causes or for other beneficial purposes. All that being said, um, to date we really haven't seen any pricing differential for a green bond. So, Pricing-wise, term-wise, it's exactly the same as what you would see for a normal bond. Um, so from the issuer's perspective, they're not really getting anything from doing these transactions. At some point, they might. Um, but as of right now, there's no economic benefit to issuing a green bond. And in fact, I'd argue there's probably a little bit of cost at this point um, because of the fact that there's no, if I can get this to go, there's no 
real um, uh, definition around what is a green project. And everybody has kind of a different view of what is a green project. Now, there have been some industry initiatives that are out there. Um, the, uh, the green bond principles that I've outlined on this slide are one of those initiatives that are out there. There's also some private sector companies that have gotten involved trying to define what exactly is a green project. Um, but as of now, there's still a lot of disagreement over that. And because of that, you're not necessarily seeing a real, a real pricing advantage. One of the other issues is um, bec there becomes difficulties in measuring here. Um, so the investors want to know that when they put their money to work, that there is actually a measurable benefit. Well, in order to sit and figure out how many cars are going to get off the road or how much water is going to be saved or you know, any of those types of measurements, it actually costs the issuer to do those reports. Um, and furthermore, there's annual monitoring. So it costs the issuer to do the annual monitoring of, okay, how many cars did I take off the road? How much you know, emissions did I save? Um, how many gallons of water were saved by this, this environmentally sound project? So there's actually a cost to doing um, some, of these, uh, some of these green bond projects right now. I think that that, that kind of carries over um, to a large degree in all the funding things that I've, I've talked about a little bit. Um, you're really you know, talking about a situation where you need to be able to quantify not only the environmental benefits of a project, but also the economic benefits of the project, and be able to say that you're doing a project not just because it's good for the environment, but because it makes good economic sense as well. Um, so what's that mean for borrowers? It means that they need to understand what the costs are of a project as well as what the benefits are. Um, and that is true both on the environmental side as well as the economic side. Um, there's a lot of tools that are out there to be able to take advantage of that. Um, um, but, you know, we can't, we, we, we need to realize that not everything is going to be eligible for free, free funding or subsidized funding. Um, and ultimately, I think, you know, where good projects make good economic sense as well as good environmental sense, you definitely see that funding will be available. Ted? Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you all very much. Um, so I want to start off by uh, talking about an issue that uh, was raised in a couple of different uh, of the presentations, which is the uh, high proportion of moves and the high proportion of fleets that are done by small and medium uh, fleets. I think the number was, uh, Chris, you had it at 75% of fleets are small and medium or 75% of moves. And Michelle, you had it, it was in the 90s or, or so. Um, and Vic, I'm not sure, you guys are probably wouldn't qualify as a, a, a small, you might be a little bit in the bigger category. Um, but so for those smaller fleets, given the uh, proportion that they represent of the market, uh, what sort of unique or additional challenges do they face in, in financing and implementing these technologies that we've talked about today? Um, and then from the bank's perspective, what, what are maybe the challenges or the opportunities in helping those smaller fleets which may be slightly uh, less capitalized um, uh, attain those technologies? Um, so Chris, I don't know if you want to start. Sure, I'll, I'll start. You know, I think the thing that we need to concentrate on is um, making a business case for the companies like Vic and others, uh, other CTA members that are working on this. It is, for better or worse, the larger fleets that are really pushing the forefront. Um, that is changing a little bit. I recently had an experience this year with a 30 truck, third generation family owned fleet um, that is looking to do um, a third of their fleet um, with. Uh, one of the zero emission truck technologies that was um, announced uh, last year. Um, you know, I think that as long as the technology makes sense for what that fleet is doing and they look at, um, you know, the technology that they're um, looking to procure and it makes business sense, you, you don't really have to go through a lot of, you know, mental hurdles to figure out how this gets done. You know, once, once the bottom line pencils out, a lot of these problems go away. But I think, um, you know, we're obviously going to see companies like Vix and others like his, um, you know, starting to figure this stuff out first just because of the, the resources available. <clears throat> um, there's a, a couple of other factors that come into play, especially in California. There's social justice issues based around the, um, the employment model. Uh, it's moving away from the traditional owner-operator model to the employee model, and that is going to force uh, industry consolidation. 
Um, a lot of these, you know, the industry historically had a very low bar of entry. That's changing. And as you introduce this technology, that's even going to put more pressure on uh, the industry consolidation. So uh, you'll, you, you, we will start to see the smaller operators st uh, dramatically diminish within the next uh, five to ten years as these additional costs come into the market. We, and the advantage that the larger trucking companies have is that we can use our resources not only to transition the labor force, but to also try to maximize uh, the investment and utilize um, uh, space that would be available to, to help offset some of the production of the fuel and the infrastructure requirements. Yeah, I, I can agree more with Vic and, um, you know, there, there's programs out there where, thankfully, the asset values of these tractors and trailers maintain and have strong residual values. So financing programs out there that are in a position to finance the asset are available. Sometimes it can be expensive. When you're able to leverage a larger corporate structure like Vic's company and some of the other larger companies, um, that's when the cost of financing these assets can be a little bit more competitive. Um, but yeah, it's as we've all discussed, costs are going up. I mean, financing these several hundred thousand dollar uh, machines um, is expensive. And not just to acquire them or to lease them, but then to maintain them and understand how to use them. Um, some of these smaller company, companies can be nimble um, and, and you know, maybe start very slowly. Um, but I think time will catch up to that, um, that capital structure where it's going to be a lot more of a challenge um, to, to, you know, manage a very small fleet given the costs associated with it. Brian, anything to add? Okay. Um, well, in the, in the category of, of costs going up, uh, Michelle, one cost that you mentioned uh, is, is uh, driver wages, and you also mentioned the uh, potential shortage of qualified drivers. At the same time, uh, we know that part of the conversation in uh, increasing electrification of the fleet is uh, potential I increasing of uh, autonomous or uh, uh, computer-assisted driving and platooning of trucks. Um, so from the perspective of, of, of the, the finance and entities and the perspective of the fleets, how do you see that tension playing out uh, as, as more and more of these new technologies are adopted? You know, as technology shifts, a lot of the need for the drivers will hopefully shift with it. But really, you, you still have to focus on what the need is today and how you can tackle those challenges. And people, at the end of the day, is, is what's going to help your companies grow and meet the demand. Um, so I think companies need to do a little bit of a better job at attracting um, maybe the untraditional driver. Maybe there's better programs out there uh, for veterans um, that could use some of their practical military experience to become commercial drivers. Um, maybe there's opportunities to reduce the age uh, limit of these commercial drivers or even focusing on some um, underrepresented communities to attract drivers. So I think, you know, there's already some, some, some focus on, on doing some of that. Um, but I think really people is a big piece of the issue today, given um, the high turnover, um, and hopefully technology will improve that over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the uh, American Trucking Association estimates that we need to bring 100,000 more drivers into the industry every year to replace the ones that we're losing. Um, and then also meet the, the increasing demands. And uh, does anyone here have satellite radio? So you've probably heard a recruiting commercial for truck drivers while you're listening to satellite radio. And, um, you know, th that's uh, no mistake. I mean, every single company in our membership and nationally is thinking about how to uh, recruit and maintain quality drivers. You see stories all over the place in our trade publications about wages increasing across the board, um, every company is out there putting out press releases about pay increases that they're offering. And so it's a good time to be a commercial driver. On, on the um, subject of automation, you know, the, the sort of sound bite that I always use is uh, you have to be 21 to get a commercial driver's license um, through federal law. Um, someone who's a 21-year-old getting your CDL today 
the likelihood you're going to lose your job to automation throughout your career by the time you retire is, is pretty slim. Um, all the publications about uh, sort of the role of automation in trucking and how long this is going to uh, take to get to what's called pure level five autonomous uh, driving are we're decades away from that. Um, in the meantime, while automation increases, there's always going to be a role for the driver um, up through that level four um, automation. And so I, I don't see this as an immediate threat to commercial drivers entering the space today. And Vic, do you want to add anything to that? The, the driver issue is a little bit more complex, even though Chris points out it's a 21-year-old. You have to be 21 years old to get, to get your license. No company will hire you unless you're 23. And that's really an insurance requirement because they feel that the younger people are less safe. So we have to really kind of look at the entire industry. Uh, one of the things that we've done is that we've moved our trucks into automatic transmissions. We've increased our female population almost to 20% of our workforce, which was pr uh, prior to that pretty much an untapped workforce. Um, we've gone to our insurance company, we've put in-house training programs in, and we've got authority to lower our hiring age down to 21. We don't find that 21-year-olds are any uh, uh, less safe than 23-year-olds. It's just that we don't, we don't put our drivers on 500 or 1,000 or 2,000-mile runs until they've got experience in that 100-mile radius. And in the 100-mile radius, it's generally easier to control. We've got, we're starting to add a lot of safety uh, equipment to our trucks, like cameras and like side uh, uh, alarms, uh, backup alarms, automatic braking. All of these things are, are uh, helping to make the vehicle much more safe to operate. Um, uh, emigration is having a factor on uh, drivers. That, you know, prior, and especially in the ports, about 85% of the workforce was traditionally Hispanic. As immigration is falling, especially in California, we're seeing that workforce diminish. That has a big impact. Uh, um, and then uh, the, the last point is the autonomous vehicles. It's going to be a while because I don't know who's going to take that liability on. I think the, the recent Tesla cases are a good example, and we want to see. We're watching that very closely. Our legal departments are watching that very closely. They want to see where that liability is going to fall. Remember that. You know, that tragic uh, accident that happened with Tesla did have someone behind the, the wheel. They did not see the, the vehicle nor the driver saw the person crossing the street. Um, who gets sued in that case? So that there's a lot of issues like that that have to work out before we're going to put an 80,000-pound vehicle going down the road governed by a computer. All right. I was just going to say I, I deal with a lot of state DOTs, um, and and I would concur with Vic and Chris that, that the autonomous vehicles are, are, you know, from their perspective, are very far down the road. And really, you know, electric vehicles, it's it's just a technology issue. You know, it's it's getting you know the batteries better and the range better. Um, but when you're talking about autonomous vehicles, it's not only technology, but it's also social. It's regulatory. It's there's a lot of other issues that are going to have to come into place. So it, even if the technology is there, you may not necessarily be ready from other uh, other aspects of society um, to be able to deal with the autonomous vehicles. Great. Um, I want to stay with you, Brian, but switch gears a little bit. Uh, on your first slide, you noted sort of the, the suite of financing options for these technologies, um, of which private finance and the capital markets is a pretty substantial portion. Um, but Michelle, you also note that, that out of your sort of uh, set of environmental projects, um, there are many, and, and freight specifically in trucking uh, may be a small portion of that. So. How do you, if at all, see uh, freight efficiency as, as a, a cornerstone or as a component of, of your um, sort of environmental investments uh, as a bank? And then for, uh, for Vic and Chris, uh, to what extent do you look to, uh, to, to private entities? And, and sort of where, you know, where do you see the, the funds coming from uh, in the future? So Brian, I don't know if you want to start off with that very small question. Um. Uh, uh, you know, from, from Generally, with the municipal entities that I'm dealing with, um, they're they're trying to be agnostic. They want to be helpful to 
um, to future technologies and to make sure they're not a hindrance, um, but at the same time, they're trying not to necessarily uh, uh, create a situation where they're picking, you know, one technology or one type of system over another. Um, and the same is true with, with our investors. Um, I think that they want to diversify. Um, you know, if you look at uh, a typical municipal bond, we have the same amount of buyers for somebody that is issuing a bond secured by gas taxes, which, you know, arguably are going to go down in the future. Um, as we do for you know a, uh, a high tech type of situation where you're talking about tolls or vehicle miles traveled. So um, from from our investor standpoint, they're trying to be somewhat agnostic about where the solutions actually are, um, and probably be somewhat diversified in terms of how where they put their money to make sure they're not putting it all in one basket. Michelle. Yeah, and I think. Brian and I are just one very specific form of capital that's available to finance this industry. There's there's so many forms of both equity and debt capital raising that these these industries have the opportunity uh, to leverage. And you know the the economy is very strong right now. Transport the dynamic of the transportation and freight and logistics industry is almost hard to fathom given the growth of our economy and the shipment and the movement of goods. Um, you know, I, in the role that I'm in at the bank, I finance mature companies and help partner with them to help them grow um, and maybe invest in new technologies if that makes sense, um, if that can create efficiencies and capacity which can make them more competitive. Um, and you know, there's all types of investors that that you can tap into, um, you know, with uh, family offices and institutional investors, wealthy individuals who are really well, willing to partner up with these dynamic industry where they are mature, but there is an opportunity to really shift the dynamics and the and the historical trends to make a difference and, and offer competition, uh, which is healthy and, and can be profitable. Um, so in my role, you know, I partner up with all of these forms of capital and whether I'm the right fit at today or I have other institutions that I work with, with that are better fits, I make sure that the companies I'm working with um, are partner up with the right, with the right groups. Mm -hmm. um. We, we are thoroughly analyzing how we are going to finance this transition, right? Even though we've been at this for 10 years, we are still in the infant stages of this technology. The way it's rolling out right now is that a, the, the, there's a lot of support from the air quality districts, the, from CARB, from CEC, from Southern Cal uh, uh, AQMD, there's a lot of support to get the ball rolling. Eventually, the trucking industry will have to go to traditional capitalization. They will have to go to the, the banks. They will have to go to traditional forms of financing these vehicles. How, how do we get there may change a little bit because we may have to look at we have to look at how long are the components on the truck going to last. Because when you go to zero and you go to an electric motor, you can get a 30-year use out of that motor. But we don't know how long the fuel cells will last. We don't know how long the batteries are going to last. We don't know a lot of things about, uh, about the technology yet, so we don't know how to finance it yet. But if, you, if, you, if, if, we, if we sat down today and put this on the back of a napkin, two things have to happen. Freight rates have to rise. Technology costs have to drop. When those two things, and they are, they're both are, both are happening as we speak. When those things, when, when they, they fall into that sweet spot and the industry can step forward and start to finance these trucks, the transition will happen quickly. Chris, do you want to add anything? Nothing to add. Vic is the one that actually runs the company, so I'll defer <laughs> to him. Sure. Um, I, I have a number of other questions, but I want to make sure we take time to look to the audience. Um, are there any audience questions right now? Right there. I mean, can we get a microphone up to the to the front? Maybe just a second. And uh, if you do have questions, please just raise your hands now, and I can identify you, and then we can uh, move on after this question. So my question is for Brian on the Alameda corridor. Um, I gather that the Bank of America is a large bondholder for the Alameda corridor uh, transportation authority. Uh, 
I've been reading that the Alamoid, the uh, receipts the, um, for use of the Alameda corridor have not um, been meeting their expenses so that the Alameda corridor transportation authority has been running an annual deficit which the ports have been making loans to the Alameda corridor authority to make that up and I think that's due to two causes one was pointed out was the 2008 recession uh, and some reduced traffic at the ports. Another is that the um, much of the the Alameda corridor is very much underutilized, maybe 30 percent capacity, because many of the much of the freight is going uh, avoiding going around the corridor by taking the 710 freeway. Uh, I also note that the um, Southern California um, International Gateway, the rail yard, has now pretty much cleared the um, California Supreme Court to go forward. So my question really is, how much would the infrastructure for a new rail yard at the uh, Southern California International Gateway uh, increase the capability or increase the traffic on the Alameda corridor so that they could get back into a positive cash flow. Thank you. Um, just a couple of thoughts. Um, first, Bank of America actually is not an investor in Alameda corridor. We uh, we served as a uh, as an underwriter, so we passed those those bonds on to uh, some some additional third parties, private capital, um, and uh, as to their performance. Um, Vic and, and his like have, uh, have, have been great competitors. So uh, as a result, you are seeing that the uh, the corridor is not as utilized. Um, but I would actually argue that's you know that's one of the advantages of of having private capital at risk. Um, the ports have made some loans. They're only obligated up to a certain point in time, um, and private capital is going to take that risk that ultimately the corridor doesn't get utilized enough to repay those loans. So you know that's a that's a positive thing for um, for private capital to be at risk. Um, they get the return, but they also get the uh, the downside if it if it was to occur. Um, in terms of you know what makes the corridor um, you know more efficient going forward, um, you know it will take uh, some some economic efficiencies. Um, we need to figure out you know why it is that the trucks are able to uh, be so much more uh, economically efficient than than using the the the, uh, the corridor. Um, that's for you know a variety of different reasons, um, but ultimately you know this is a competitive market, um, and that you're seeing that competition play out um, you know literally every day with the shippers when they decide to use either the corridor or use uh, use a trucking uh, trucking company Vic do you want to re respond uh, th there's a little bit of a, I think a, a misunderstanding of what traffic goes through the corridor trucks are not competing for that freight that freight is that ultimately ends up in Chicago ultimately ends up in Memphis Tennessee it's it's mostly rail freight that's leaving the basin um, uh, it the probably the largest reason that the corridor is not meeting its goals is because a considerable amount of traffic has left Southern California over the last couple of years and gone through the Panama Canal, gone up through Canada, uh, gone to, down to Mexico. So there's a uh, there, there's been a market share effect on the corridor. That's improving as we speak, as the economy improves, as Southern California uh, improves its efficiency cargo is coming back. We should, and then there's also a little bit of an infrastructure problem at certain terminals that don't have access on the terminal to load a rail uh, uh, car. So, and, and that's changing as well. The ports are making major investments in putting more rail uh, capability on those terminals. So all of these things will have the impact of, of getting the corridor numbers back to where they should be. Um, so, Vic, you mentioned uh, diversion of, of freight internationally, and, and I note on one of Michelle's slides, the emphasis was on uh, increasing capacity, uh, uh, significant growth in the sector, and a, and a potential uh, uh, need for greater capacity. At the same time, uh, economic slowdown is always a possibility, and um, 
even just a, a, a decrease in international trade based on federal policy is, is certainly a possibility. Um, in either case, how can we make sure that in the, in the case of increased capacity, these new technologies are, are taking that new capacity and are, and are filling those, that spot? And in the case of slowdown and decreased capacity, that we're not losing investment in these technologies and, and we're not losing time um, if, if money dries up? That's a great question. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, that's strictly economics. That's economics 101. As the economy, you could see as the economy is getting better, jobs getting better, pay, pay is, uh, uh, is increasing. Um, you know, it's, I don't know if it's the Amazon effect or what, but the economy is doing very, very well. Uh, so we can make these investments, we can make these advances because we have the capital to do it. If the economy slows down, I don't know. That's a, you know, who knows? Yeah. That's why I work for a conservative institution. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, um, we, we underwrite these, these forecasting. We, we understand industry dynamics. We understand trends. We understand the recessionary environment that we were in 10 years ago, that we were in 15 years ago, and we're aware that there are cycles and that we need to be in a position where we can shift. Um, we need to underwrite um, cash flows. We need to underwrite assets. We have to underwrite a secondary source of repayment um, when um, industries lose their biggest customer or um, lose a certain mode of, of, of revenue. Um, so, you know, we've been in this, in this strong cycle for, for some time now and something will turn. And, and in one of my slides, I think it was 2025, um, where there's an expectation that maybe the transportation industry will slow down. Um, so we, we have to be aware of that. Um, so I'd like to, we have just about a minute left and I'd like to just conclude uh, with a question, um, which I think each of you can answer. Uh, maybe give us a final thought, which is that um, the, the Clean Air Action Plan obviously is a bit uh, unique uh, nationwide, um, but that said, it's also the largest port complex in the nation by far. Um, so to what extent do you see the port programs as uh, driving changes throughout the rest of the country, and to what extent um, uh, should they, and, and to, to what extent can your institutions help that drive um, so that it becomes more of a nationwide uh, uh, acceptance of these technologies? And uh, I believe, as far as the last time I checked, um, other competitor port complexes have not even done the changes that the ports of LA and Long Beach did back in like 2008. And so as far as whether or not the you know, California policies at large are pushing change in the rest of the country, um, I, I don't know that you can say that. Um, you know, if you look at uh, you know, certain things that are happening at the federal level or, you know, other things like CTA is running a bill right now um, to increase penalties um, for uh, fleet operators who might bring in something called a glider vehicle, which uh, may be equipped with a refurbished uh, pre-emission control engine. So these are sort of the things that we're dealing with in, in California. Our companies are spending billions of dollars to uh, invest in new technology and new equipment. Um, but still we're having to face some of these, you know, issues of other, other states um, and other, um, you know, industry partners not following our lead. We, we uh, operate in several ports throughout the country and the, the disadvantage that uh, California has as opposed to those ports is that they never had the brown air that we had here in California. And many of us who, who either grew up here or moved here and remember those years realize that the effect that this basin has, the, the effect that the sun and the hydrocarbons have on this basin, they just concentrate it and they keep it here. What happens in other parts of the country, it blows out. On the East Coast, for instance, you don't see those, those real uh, smoggy days in C Seattle. You know, it's kind of a rainforest up there. You don't see the same effects that we see here in Southern California. So the, so the political and the, um, the, the, the emphasis on wanting to clean the air up is not as great in other parts of the country. But it's going, it's going to catch up. New Jersey's made several runs at it. The industry's been very strong there in resisting it. Uh, we see Seattle is, like Southern California, very progressive when it comes to the climate change. 
Um, the southeast, we're, we're, we don't see the concentration of the pollution because they just have not had the traffic. That's changing. So as, the, as these ports develop and become more sophisticated and, and there's more of a concentration of cargo in these areas, they're going to have their problems. Our philosophy is that our, the blueprint that we're building here in Southern California, we're going to take nationwide. So we're going to go to these other ports with a clean fleet. And, and, you know, I'm just proud of working for an institution that is aware that, that we have an issue, that climate change is real. And, and we started this discussion 10 years ago. We made a commitment um, to the business community and to the consumer community that, that we wanted to make an investment. And that investment grew from $20 billion to now $125 billion. So it's exciting to be able to have these discussions with my credit and risk teams to say, you know, this not only is it a good business model, not only does it make market sense, but it's also going to make a difference in, in our clear, um, in our environmental uh, future. Um, and, you know, sponsoring events like this, getting the, the private and public sectors to be talking and making a difference and doing good things is, is what we need to continue to do. And Brian, last word? Yeah, I don't have a whole lot more to add other than um, I deal with governments from Colorado out to Hawaii up to Alaska, and I agree with Vic. It may take a while, but ultimately what happens here in California will get exported to all of those places. Um, you know, just California is a leader. It may take time, um, but ultimately, you know, I see it every day in the, in the governments I deal with. They, when I go outside of the state of California, they want to know what's happening in California because it, it's, it's viewed as best practices, whether that's in finance or whether that's in any other area. Great. Thank you. That's an excellent note to end on. Um, thank you to all four panelists uh, for an interesting discussion. Um, we are now going to take a uh, strict 10-minute break, um, which is really a six-minute break. Uh, our next panel starts at 3 o'clock. Thank you.